Central America, right? And it's about the size of Massachusetts. So you guys know how big Massachusetts is. It's, it's, it's very small, teeny tiny. But that being said, it is the most densely populated country, which means it's very crowded. There's a lot of people. There's 7 million people living in the country. 64% of them living in the like in major urban areas of it. Um, and, and it's actually, it's really cool. Um, uh, El Salvador is, is definitely in need of Christ. You can go to the next slide. Um, the flag of El Salvador is, is really neat. Um, 
the white stripe in the middle represents peace and the blue stripes represents the sea. So it's peace on the sea. And this is kind of important when you know the name of El Salvador. Who knows what El Salvador means? Anyone speak Spanish? What do you think it means? The Savior, yes. So El Salvador literally translates to the Savior. So the flag is representing that is that Jesus calmed the storm. He is the, the peacemaker. He brings peace in the water. Oh, one thing um, to add to that of El Salvador being the savior, it was uh, before the name was El Salvador del Mundo, the savior of the world. And it's pretty cool. We all, we all uh, will see a slide of a statue of Jesus on the old globe. And there you go, that one. It's in the center of the capital. And it's the most beautiful thing to see in real life. And it's just like, Everyone goes, and if you see it everywhere driving, it's just impactful to see it. All right, well, I'm going to let my dad talk about his recent experiences here um, in the country and growing up there. So here you go. Thank you. One of the main things in El Salvador, out of the seven point plus million uh, people who live there, is only above. 10% of people in El Salvador who have a lot of money. 90% of the rest of the population are hardworking people. People from the villages, we call them cantones or cantons. We call them, uh, uh, it's just mainly departments where rural people, where rural land is, uh, where hardworking people. Like, I grew up, actually, if you see me, this is where you normally see people working out there. This is the clothing they use. This is the kind of uh, hat they wear so they can cover themselves from the heat of the sun. And there's some tools that I grow. They, they call them, El Salvador, they call them kuma, which is a kind of a curved machete. But this is to kind of clean up the cornfields or cotton or whatever, but everything, is planted over there. This is for a left-handed individual and another one for the right-handed. See? Everyone has a different tool. Now, I wanted to show you a little bit of that. This being the, the worker. And this hut here is the boss. <laughs> see, there's the difference. Can you see the difference? Right. It's very interesting. Those who are the, we call them here the farmers. The farmers are own, own their own land and work on them, right? In El Salvador, landowners dress like this. They, they can wear like this, they got boots, no sandals. They wear boots and these kind of hats. But most of the people who are the workers wear the different hat. And the sandals, just like this. And most of the people also carry a little bag. We, we call this calabazo, okay? This is where we carry the water to drink while we're working out there, okay? That little hole where you pull it. This is a fruit actually that grows on some trees, and that's how uh, this this is mature and it's hard. But this is pretty much when I grew up. Nowadays, everything is made out of plastic, right? Mm. So everything has changed and evolutionated a little bit. But I personally probably can say I grew up like this. I'm come from a one of one of the many poor villages in El Salvador. In the province of Usulután, that's where I grew up. And uh, as as I was eight years old, there was not much to do out there, but we will have to build our own toys, so we'll keep ourselves busy. One of the very uh, common toys in El Salvador is called the capirucho. In Mexico, they call it bolero, bolero, something like that, which is a big one. But this is capirucho. In El Salvador, they use this 
uh, say national sport, they do uh, national competitions with this, as a matter of fact. But I personally grew up with this. What is this? The slingshot, you saw it there. This, a lot of kids, as, as we grow up over there, uh, and still they, they still use that, this is a hunting tool. Because we are so poor, you cannot really have uh, anything to buy hunting tools. Or even fishing rods. We don't see fishing rods over there, but up in the ocean with the rich people. But for, for fishing out there, we actually use the regular, uh, just a line, a hook and a stone. No, not even, we don't buy no weight. Okay? <laughs> it's very interesting. Wow. But people find their way to make a living. So I grew up as, as, as I was years, eight years old, um, I used to go out hunting with one of this thing shot. It wasn't beautiful as this one. This is, I purchased this at the market. I made my own hooks. We call them hooks or handles, okay? We call them ganchos. And I used to build my own. I used to build my own toy, my own caperuchos. And there was another type of something called trompo, but I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to get a trompo. Is a, a piece of wood with a, a spindle top. They call it a spindle top. Right. Okay, but uh, out of wood, something very interesting, very special. But one of the things I want to share with you is that um, the experience we, uh, uh, all these people who are back there in El Salvador, they suffer so much of too many, too many diseases because there is no. Uh, there's not much help from the government over there, like I said at the beginning. Only about 10% of the population is kind of rich, okay? And I would say there are seven families in El Salvador that control the whole country economics. That's about it. There's, there's middle class, hardworking people who are professionals. You can graduate from, from university over there, but there's no jobs. So that nobody can raise up to a middle class or high mid. That's, the, that's why, even though we have some people who are professional, graduated from universities up there, they're still working and making such a low pay raise. The minimum pay raise over there is $250 per month. That is for people who are teachers. Teachers. <laughs> Individuals who are professional who are uh, engineers. I know engineers who make $300 a month. Security personnel, bodyguards, and police, the police officers make $350 a month. That's all they make. So it is very, um, it's a very poor country based on the laws and government. We should pray now as well for the turmoil is going on within politics over there. As you see, politics turmoil everywhere is still there. And those who suffer the most are the kids, the children of El Salvador. Why? Because adults sometimes they want to think for them. And if the, if the parents want to do something for their kids, they can't. It's very hard sometimes. So it, it is up to us. Outside of the country, uh, we can help somehow. And, uh, on a personal level, my family and I, we, we've been to El Salvador to, to help out some families. Uh, I wish I would have had the videos. We've done some for Christmas season and uh, some, some, some family members who have helped us out to bring some relief to some of these kids during Christmas and other times. Because there is not only Christmas needs, there's needs every, every day. Every day they suffer. And, uh, I wanted to share that with you because as we talk about today's BGMC. So you can put that in your heart. If you want to help a child, you want to help some children, that's the, that's the most beautiful thing we can do. And what your heart gets filled with is that emotion that got no price for what you have done for someone who is in need. We've seen so many videos of activities in El Salvador that churches do, but, and, and, it's, and it's never enough. That's never enough. The most we can do, 
the best it gets for them, the better it gets for them. But I wanted to show you a little bit of, like I say, the, or the origins over there, okay? And uh, some, some of my pride, that is pride, my, my personal pride, because like I say, I grew up like that. God gave me the opportunity to be here, to immigrate to this country, and uh, become who am I now? Just a servant of the Lord. And uh, I just really, really want to uh, encourage every one of you to visit El Salvador. Mm -hmm. There are many beautiful places that you can actually go and enjoy as well. There are many places that you can enjoy by visiting for a day or hours, whatever, but you will enjoy it the most when you go to a, a place where you can help children. There are, uh, what do you call it, uh, nursing homes, but there are nursing homes over there are not just like here. Over there is just, uh, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just a, a shack where they keep these elders in wooden beds, not even mattresses. They feed them maybe once a day because the places are very poor and there is not government sustainment. No, there is no money from the government for those places. Those places live out of uh, donations from people like you and I. The most important meal of the day. I'll defend it to my core. <laughs> and um, the Salvadoran breakfast is absolutely delicious. So Antonio likes to start with uh, cafe con leche, which is coffee with milk. Um, I love this. It's it's a, basically a latte, but it's it's boiled milk, and then they put the coffee in, and ah, oh, it's delicious. I absolutely love it. I have it as much as I can, but usually I save it for like Christmas time, just because the way it's prepared is really good. Um, and uh, also the the it's called the plato tipico. It's usually eggs, plantains, cheese, beans, rice, and a tortilla. Right, so that that's the, the typical breakfast in El Salvador. But many people don't get to eat that, right? So most meal, the staple foods of El Salvador are rice, beans, and tortillas, and that's the most common. But um, a special meal that unfortunately we didn't get to bring to you guys today because of the rules uh, is a Salvadorian staple called the pupusa. How many of you guys have heard of pupusas? <laughs> Oh, they're delicious. Anyone who's had a pupusa will tell you they're like the best. Um, so there are these thick corn tortillas stuffed with uh, red beans and cheese and often vegetables. And I like mine with uh, a chicharron. So it's, it's like the like pork, 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 like fried pork. Pork, pork. And it's all mixed together and it tastes delicious. And you eat that with, um, it's like a coleslaw, but it's not, it's called curtido and tomato sauce. Um, huh? Yeah, it's like radishy. Yeah, it's really good. I, I, you have to taste it. There, there's a couple places in Houston uh, that you guys definitely check out. Uh, and there's also um, tamales, which Salvadoran tamales are different from Mexican tamales. Salvadoran tamales are wrapped in banana leaves, not corn husks. And because of that, the texture is a little bit different. They're a little bit softer. Um, they're a little bit mushier and they're usually stuffed with chicken and uh, garbanzo beans and like green beans and potatoes. They're delicious. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> one, of, one more food thing that I want to talk about is sopa de pata. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> sopa de pata is my favorite soup in the world. Um, it's corn, plantains, uh, other vegetables like cabbage and potatoes. Uh, but the main ingredient is tripe. Who knows what tripe is? Anyone want to guess what tripe is? Fish. No. no. So tripe is the lining of a cow's stomach. Yeah. I know it sounds weird. It's like it's the lining, but it's so good. It's got. If you guys like gummy candies, you're gonna love some. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh. And the hooves are in there oh, for added flavor. Oh. 
They're delicious. But one big question. Yes. It's time to play Cow, Chicken, Pig. The game where you can be a cow, a chicken, or a pig. So stand up and choose which animal you want to be. But choose carefully because if your animal is eliminated, then you are out. tropical region um, so it only has a fall uh, a rainy season and a dry season there's no um, like summer fall winter spring mm -hmm. last time. <laughs> I forgot it <laughs> for a second mm -hmm. um, but the the dry season lasts from November to April and the rainy season lasts from March to October so if, if you ever want to go what do you think? Dry or rainy season? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> so I, I prefer the rainy season because it helps it's cool things it's off. Cool down, yeah. It gets really hot. Uh, there are places um, where El Salvador just is ridiculously hot. Um, it's also becoming a hub of tourism in Central America, uh, particularly ecotourism. It's still full of many untouched natural um, areas. So how many of you guys like rainforests? I love rainforest. If, if you like pretty animals and stuff, um, uh, El Salvador is home to hundreds of, of, of many species. Yeah, species that are only found in El Salvador. Um, and four uh, turtle species, sea turtle species, call the shores of El Salvador their home. Uh, which, I'm, if you know me, they're my favorite animals. I love mm -hmm. turtles. Something um, funny about turtles, though. People eat turtles over there, and yeah. they eat turtle eggs, eggs. Yes. they uh -huh. make soup eggs. <laughs> that being said, they have a very good preservation program, um, and, and El Salvador actually does uh, invest in, in helping, uh, and this kind of an international um, effort to, to help with the turtle species, and they have hatchings every year. Um, the shore of El Salvador is along the Pacific coast, so the waters are pretty cold. It's really nice though. Uh, it's cold water. Um, the sand is very diversified because of the volcanic region. So some areas are kind of that, that white sand, but other areas are black sand beaches, right? And they're very pebbly. Mm -hmm. So there's black sand, uh, like um, where, where we like to go to the beach, um, there's, there's regular sand like along the shore. And then the further out you go in, there's black sand and it's very pebbly. Um, and that's all because of the volcanic ash. Speaking of which, El Salvador is home to over 20 volcanoes and quite a few large lakes. Um, two of them are currently active. The last major eruption uh, happened only a couple of years ago, but in 2001 was the last major earthquake. Uh, it was 7.7 .7 on the Richter scale. I don't know if you guys know the Richter scale. 
but the highest number is 9. So 7.7 .7 is pretty high up there. Uh, it causes tsunami that causes a lot of damage. Um, El Salvador is still recovering from that. Um, but a lot of um, the new structural and engineering uh, that they're doing in El Salvador is, is helping the country become more earthquake proof. Um, one cool fact about their volcanoes is my favorite. Uh, there's a place, Cojute, is where Ilopango is, right? Yeah. yeah. So where my mom is from, uh, and where my family has their house, Cojute Peque, um, this, is, this is the city of Cojute. That's the, um, that's the overlook from the, huh? From El Cerro, which is this mountain trail that you can climb up, and it's really beautiful. So you can see the whole city. Uh, is that the last picture of the lake? Yeah, so that's Lake Ilopango. Um, so the really cool thing about last uh, uh, Lake Ilopango, this used to be a volcano. Whoa. It used to be a volcano, and uh, 1,500 years ago, and about the year 535, um, it blew up. Whoa. It exploded with such force that it created an ice age for two years. So the earth was covered in, in soot, and like the geological records show this, um, that the earth was covered in soot and ash, and so much that it, it nearly decimated the Mayan population to extinction, um, and, and it caused a worldwide famine that year because of this one volcano exploding. So as a result, we have Lake Ilopango, uh, underneath of which is still a volcano. <laughs> Uh, it's not active anymore, um, but it could, you know, at some point. I went on originally a 10-day trip to El Salvador, uh, and this is where I had to learn my Spanish all over again. I had to practice it. Um, I got to know the people. I got to know their culture. And because, you know, I'm from here, this is my home, um, but... I, I do have my roots there, my origins there, um, and I spent a lot of time uh, in El Salvador appreciating what El Salvador is, and also the name, because I did get to get closer to my Lord and Savior Jesus there. Um, I got really sick back in 2016, uh, really, really sick, almost to the point where, you know, I was going to die, um, and I didn't know. I went on a trip um, for 10 days, I was on vacation. And my dad's like, hey, I know a doctor. Do you want to go see him? And I was like, yeah, sure, let's go see him. And so we go. And immediately he's like, there's something, there's something wrong with your liver. He just, just by looking at me, he, he, he tells me that. And I was like, huh, that's strange. Like, you know, I've been to a couple of doctors who told me that I have like a fatty liver. He says, no, this is, this is beyond that. So they run some tests. Um, and, and he's like, okay, well, they're not going to let you leave because you might have a condition that could be viral and they're not going to let you leave. So at first, you know, I was kind of freaking out, not knowing quite sure what was going on. But um, as we got, you know, tested a little bit more, you know, the doctor narrowed down what it is that I had. And, and he said, all right, well, we can start treating you right away. So two weeks, which is three days after I was supposed to leave, I started treatment. And my dad had to leave, so he, he only could stay with me like another couple of weeks, and then he had to end up leaving. So I was alone over there for, for most of my time. I was fortunate enough to, I saw a family over there, so I was able to stay with them. <clears throat> but in those times, right, I was, there was a lot of times where I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that I was taking medicine, and I was getting like, blood drawn like three times a week. And, you know... After about a month, the doctor says, hey, David, you're, you're doing so much better. Um, and <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's really great. I'm glad I'm doing better. He's like, yeah, I, I'm glad that you're doing better because two weeks ago, you know, we could have started this treatment and it wasn't working and, and like you could have, you know, you would have collapsed by now. You would have been dead by now. Um, and I was surprised because, you know, for me, I wasn't the healthiest lad. I was eating bad food, <laughs> but but 
I didn't do anything bad to my body. I wasn't drinking, I wasn't doing drugs, or nothing like that. And I was just surprised, and I was like, Lord, what's, what's going on? I, I, I thought I was healthy, um, but, but really, the Lord used this opportunity, this little vacation, to save my life. And as a result, um, I, not only did I get physically better, but I got spiritually better, because I was at a point in my life, um, I was serving the Lord, and I loved Jesus, and I believed Jesus, but I was kind of letting my faith go by the wayside, right? I wasn't really reading the word. I wasn't really praying. I was just kind of like, you know, I, I believe this, but this is a Sunday, Wednesday thing. I have other things I have to worry about. But as I got better physically, you know, I was diving into the word, and, and it, was, it was a period of my life where God took me away, held me close to him, and he says, hey, I'm your savior. I'm here for you. I'm going to heal you, and I'm going to carry on. And when I got back, I, I felt different, right? I, I was starting to look better physically, but the whole time, you know, I, I'm a very optimistic person. I always like to smile, and I like to laugh. And the doctor, I remember telling me, he was like, man, I've never seen you in here, like, crying. I've never seen you, you know, sad or, or defeated. Like, what keeps you going? And I was just like, the joy of the Lord. It's the only thing. Like, I have the joy of the Lord, and I remember clearly... One day before, I was in the hospital before they were doing the biopsy. And I was a little nervous. And I heard a woman crying outside of the hospital window. And, and she was crying because I think her, her dad died. Um, and I just remember I started praying for her and for her family. I was like, Lord, just be with them. And I just remember a peace coming upon me. And I said, Lord, regardless of the result today, I know that you are with me. And I know that... If I die here, I'm going to be in paradise. And, and ever since then, I've, I've never been scared of, of, of anything, right? I've just been, I've trusted the Lord. I'm like, Lord, whatever happens, I know that I'm okay. Um, and, and I carried that with me. When I came back, you know, the changes that he made, you know, it, it took a little while to stick because it's a discipline sometimes that you have to, you have to follow. But it really changed my life because I saw life as something more, more valuable. And I saw life as something um, that, that we have to spend serving the Lord. And so I had to make decisions and changes in my life that hurt to make, but it was worth it because now I'm, you know, I'm here. You know, I'm, I'm talking to you guys and serving the Lord. And, and I've never been happier before in my life because the joy of the Lord is with me and I'm being able to to share that with you guys, to share his love, not just here, but with the people of El as well. At that time, I, I remember I had a couple conversations with people and, and little debates about, you know, the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church and, and, and what I believed in, how Jesus and what he meant to me. Um, and and that, that's sometimes, you know, sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to go to a place that we didn't expect to be for the Lord to use us in ways that we didn't expect to be. Um, so for, for that, I will always you know, be grateful for my time in our Bible. And I hope to go back soon. Uh, COVID can't be over fast enough because I, I really want to go. Uh, I miss the beaches, I miss the food, I miss the people. Um, even though I don't listen to a lot of Spanish music, I miss just having Spanish music on in the background because it's something atmospheric. But I, I encourage you guys, one, pray for us out. It's the number one thing that you can do. Two, get to be community, you know, um, and get your friends to do. And three, whenever you get the chance, visit El Salvador because you're going to love it. It's beautiful. You know, it's, the food is delicious. Um, the people are amazing. And you guys can share that love with whoever you want.